Hey, what's up everyone? This is Alex here. So back with another video. So this time around, it's about me reviewing my Singapore National Table Championship 2022 journey. So I made a quick analysis of the round by round ranking. So on the left, you would see that this is the final rank of all players. So uh, Bo Xiang, Ko Bo Xiang actually ranked number one after the seven rounds of Swiss pairing. Anthony followed by Anthony in number two, me in number three, and Li Chunfeng as number four. So that kind of rounded up the semi-finals uh, for the top four after the preliminary round. So if you do a quick uh, analysis on the trend in terms of the ranking, you can see uh, at mostly within the top 10 uh, players, uh, most of them would have already, you know, kind of obtained the top four ranking at least once within the entire tournament. So that's interesting. Maybe just Chu Ching Wen <laughs> is the outlier who was number one rank for after round one and then thereafter kind of like couldn't really recover back into the top 10 so um what's kind of interesting for my own journey was that i started off with a win and then followed by a loss in round two against sky another win and then another round uh four loss uh sorry round two loss against jin fong and a round four loss against sky actually and then thereafter if you look at the trending on the chart on the right you would see that you know for the top four uh with bo xiang as number one he just started off with ranks six uh, within round one and two and then pretty much just held on to do a seven straight win so you can see his trend is pretty straightforward with anthony he probably started off a bit strong and then kind of like zigzag his way back into number two position for uh, me <laughs> i actually started off with number seventh position kind of like sunk all the way down to as low as 15 uh, did a kind of u-turn or something they call a submarine tactic not to show whether this is useful but it's always kind of like uh, thrilling and exciting to kind of be able to bounce back from this uh you know couple of losses and just jump jump back into the top four so finally in the last round i did have a big win against jin Fong, uh by luck i guess um chalking up quite a big uh big bright well i think quotient and then of course most of the uh closer players uh had close wins or close ties so basically i was able to kind of like uh, get into the top three position just by bright well and with Jun Fong, he probably started off with slightly lower ranking and kind of made his way up, zigzag way up, more in the uptrend, finally securing his number four spot. So that's pretty interesting. So I think in this video, I'll just go over two games that I've lost. So namely, the, the game that was interesting was probably my round two game against Jun Fong. Um, and of course, uh, my finals game against Bo Xiang. So of course in the semifinals, uh, usually the first rank and the second rank, uh, the first rank and the fourth rank will play each other in semifinals one. So that one, Bo Xiang winning 34-30, me and Anthony playing uh, second and third, playing in semifinals two. I won that one to 54 to 10, and then I think uh, Jun Fong emerged uh, victorious as the third position against Anthony, and then uh, against Bo Xiang I lost uh, 27 to 37. So let's quickly jump into. Uh, me and Junfeng's game and then we'll probably touch on the finals game and probably walk through my, my thought process on the games and just share with you you know how how uh, I was thinking throughout the game hey so let's take a look at the round two game that I had against Junfeng so I was playing as black so obviously uh, in every tournament usually when you start off a tournament you always want to do well <laughs> you probably don't want to go into a submarine tank tactic but unfortunately i kind of lost this game so unfortunately i probably had to try to you know bounce back from the losses so i was black and he was white so we kind of started off with a very typical uh opening to stephenson so i did the stephenson and then basically he had the choice between no kong and come off so he chose come off and basically i chose the usual book line to stephenson so this is kind of like how the sequence played out so I think most players who actually have some basic knowledge of the book would probably be able to kind of follow onto here. So um, basically over here, I wanted to kind of do a sub variation. So the kind of interesting thing, the good and bad thing about myself when I go into a tournament is that sometimes I try to like to do some variation that I've never played before just to kind of challenge myself a little bit. So up to here, it's just book. And then I think more recently, uh, I've seen some of the online players play this variation. I think it might be this move instead of this, but somehow I decided to play a4 over here. So a4, um, the interesting thing about a4 is that uh, it almost immediately gives up a very easy quiet move to white, which was where uh, essentially Jin Fong played. 
So um, over here, I think I, I started <laughs> realizing I, I made an, a mistake. I think I probably should have jumped into the center first. So now this created a lot of uh, poisoning moves. So I had no choice. I realized I was already making a mistake in the opening, perhaps. So I just jumped into the center, try to keep my this organized, regrouped. Over here, instead of going here immediately and opening up this quiet move for me, Jin Fong uh, correctly identified that probably this move is better. So to keep this this intact, these two this, one of them intact so that this move continues to be poisoned. So Jin Fong played this, didn't want to give up an easy move to me. So over here, uh, as this was still poison, I couldn't really play it. So I basically elected to just uh, go over here to the tip since there wasn't much of a chance of him playing to the top yet. So he went along with this quiet move and I realized uh, over here I'm pretty much behind because all my moves are pretty much poison. I can't really give up the edge nicely uh, without flipping this one and I also can't really play this because it's poisoned and most of the moves around here are poisoned badly. So in the end I kind of just went with, you know, head and tail, this being the head, this being the tail end. Although it flips three this in two different directions, I thought, you know, maybe if white went here, I can just cross it back here, and white went here, I can just regroup here. But um, over here, white uh, selected to play this move. Uh, no, sorry, this move, I think. So thereafter, I played over here. No, sorry, I think white played this move. My apologies. I played here because I wanted to regroup. And then over here, white correctly played to the cut, and I played to the cross back. So over here, white went down to the poison uh, centralization. So this is quite uh, standard and a very nice cut. So Chunfeng is usually quite good at these moves. And then of course, I jumped into the center over here, just to try to squeeze in between. Over here, uh, White didn't really go for this one, but instead he went for multiple tempo. So at the same time, he can retain the edge, but at the same time, he has one more move up to the C2 move. So over here, I didn't really have much of choice. I had to split this this up just to create more moves to the right because I kind of omitted this. I think over here, I was already uh, as far behind as 14, perhaps. So interestingly, um, White didn't choose to kind of immediately give up the edge to me. And instead, he wanted to retain that for future usage. So he played a nice quiet move to the center. Um, he's still fairly ahead over here at this point. But I thought that, you know, maybe for me it's easier. Because if I were to remove this white disc, he wouldn't have access to this. So this would be still fairly defensive for me. But at the same time, he does have that spare tempo up to the top. So I kind of feel that at least I have some breathing space this way. But uh, I'm still pretty much far behind so I just jumped into the center, waiting for a white-black continuation, which did happen. So white uh, controlling this, he wanted to poison this. So instead of just flipping this, this immediately, I went to the top just to cut that off. So that I can continue to keep this as white, so that I have some future access in the future. So, future access, <laughs> future access in the future, interesting. But yeah, basically white went with this. And then over here, I did think a little bit. Um, if I were to go with the regular kind of forming a pear shape to the top, uh, it would make it black, white, and it would be too straightforward a win for white. So interestingly, when you're kind of down and out um, in such a position, you would realize that actually maybe a vertical cut, even forming a one square gap over here might be useful because you're trying to cut all the key lines, keeping this mini diagonal over here from uh, C4 all the way down to F7. And of course, this main diagonal between uh, F3 and C6 would also be controlled. So that's what I did. And I guess, uh, given how white was, you know, still fairly ahead, he wasn't too concerned about that until much later. So I think this is kind of like the way that you have to struggle when you're far back behind. You have to try to cut away key access, make the game a little bit more extreme so that you make it possible for yourself to kind of struggle. So obviously after the continuation, <coughs> excuse me, I realized the this strength of this lead diagonal and this mini diagonal. So I did kind of see a possibility. So I immediately went here to feed off the edge, and which he did take correctly. But thereafter I decided to play the X square to kind of apply some pressure. So at the same time while I'm controlling this mini diagonal across, which he doesn't have access to, 
I played this to kind of block up his moves, and black, white wouldn't have any access along this way as well. And this would just be feeding off a strong edge to me, so this kind of put some pressure on Junfeng over here. But I think he was still kind of comfortable, because he was still plus 8 over here, I think. And he found that, you know, he could just cut in simply. So this was how it followed. So interestingly, uh, over here, I already kind of planned for this because um, I wanted him to commit to this so that I can go for the wedge uh, into this X square, feed off the corner, jump in. If he takes, I'll just take this and have parity. So that was kind of the plan. But um, what happened was after this, um, I think the best move for white was probably the corner over here. But white actually missed it and just went for parity to the right and then kind of fell into my trap. So I did go for this, and then follow up over here, uh, white did play this. So over here, actually, after this exchange, I was already up plus 8, I think. And somehow, I'm not too sure why, uh, when I thought about the sequences over here when I played here, uh, somehow I kind of, you know, uh, took a step back and decided that maybe I'll play g2, and that was kind of my losing move. At this point, I was already up plus 8, and if I were to just commit to my original plan, uh, I would have been able to secure um, the win somehow in terms of the follow-up sequence. But yeah, I guess, you know, I got kind of um, maybe a little too excited after kind of pulling off this maneuver and then kind of forgot that, you know, this is after all odd region, I should probably jump in first. Uh, but I was concerned black, white, then what do I do? So um, probably jump in here, black, white, black, maybe. And I would have been able to, to win the game. So I kind of missed it here. So I went over here. And thereafter, uh, White did realize that, you know, this was a mistake on my part. And he immediately covered back. Uh, and then thereafter, I kind of lost the game from there. Uh, no way out from there. So I think this game is interesting. Um, even though I did start off with a bad opening, I did kind of find an opportunity to kind of like struggle. I think the key move over here was D1 for me. That vertical cut, cutting off the mini diagonals and the main diagonals try to create some um, errors for my opponent. So I think that's important when you play a game, and that's the also the interesting and attractive thing about Othello, in a sense that usually even if you're down and out, if you play it in a certain way, you can probably force your opponent to commit some errors. So um, just a message for this game in particular, you know, never give up. Just always keep trying, always keep pushing, even if you're losing. Try to find certain ways to make the game complicated, force some errors from your opponent. Even if you are losing from a very one-sided point of view, try to make the game interesting for your opponent. Maybe make some unexpected moves. Yeah, so who knows, maybe you might have some chance here and there. So yeah, let's move on to the final game review. So now let's go into the final game analysis. So in the final game, Bo Xiang being the number one rank in the Swiss pairing and me being the third, obviously he has the right to choose a uh, color or draw win and he went with draw win, thinking that you know maybe you know he's, there's a 50% chance that I might choose a color that he doesn't want to play. So in the end, I did choose white, uh, the typical color that you choose when you want to retain parity, and in an important, crucial game. So this was the finals of the SNOC, uh, so basically I'll play it from my perspective, and he started off with this move, we went quickly into perpendicular, interestingly he chose to play calm off, which is something that, you know, he doesn't usually play against me, so I think that maybe caught me by surprise a little bit, in terms of the opening selection. So over here, I did have the choice between No Kung and Kong Moth. Uh, typically, No Kung gives lesser variation, while uh, Kong Moth gives more variation within the end game result. So this is more like a high risk, high return, low risk, low return. So um, I think a lot of friends uh, <laughs> commented that, you know, um, not too sure why we went with this high risk, high return opening variation uh, when it's a finals game. But, you know, I kind of think that, you know, as long as you know the opening well, even if it's a high risk, high return, it's perfectly fine to actually play it. So interestingly, uh, Bo Xiang went to the typical opening, which is, uh, you know, the book opening. So not too sure uh, whether that was the intention. So basically, uh, we played out uh, the typical calm off, uh, Stephenson to calm off variation over here. He went in here. And I think... Um, my calm off is, you know, fairly orthodox and, you know, probably pretty stable, I hope. So that's why I was pretty confident going into the calm off opening. 
So let's see. So the typical sequence uh, ends up here. Black takes the side. Um, so white kind of jumps out over here. So the typical response over here is for black to take here, uh, being the center square, just regrouping to the side. But instead, Bosan decided to play a variation over here, more like a diamond shape over here, a mini diamond shape. So typically in some mid-game op openings, uh, I mean, in the opening of mid-games, when your opponent doesn't play the supposed best move and play somewhere else, this then becomes kind of like the best move that you could play. So I did take some time to think about this, uh, also because it was a variation, I didn't want to rush my moves. So over here, uh, Vosian went ahead to play over here. So this kind of gives a little bit of uh, added stress from a perspective that, you know, when you're looking at this shape to the top, it's a solid edge, and at the same time, I don't have access to either of these moves. It does gives a little bit of excess squeeze. Yeah, so there is a slight pressure over here. So over here, I just elected to play G4, creating this disc at F4 in order to kind of regroup back. So at least that was the intention. So I was kind of expecting black to play here, followed by white uh, reverse to cut back to try to access. But interestingly, black didn't choose to, to play that move. Instead, uh, so over here, interestingly, uh, what black decided to do was to jump into the center over here, flipping for this three different directions. Not the typical variation that you'll see, but it's essentially trying to carve out a center path, leaving this uh, move. So over here, I rightly uh, played this move to A4 just to kind of squeeze him into the side. So I think over here, I think Black decided to apply a bit of pressure in terms of taking this move first uh, to kind of form this solid row over here. So that um, even, so I, I did feel a bit of slight sense of pressure as white uh, about whether I should take it or not. Because if I took it, white, black can take two tempos over here. So essentially, if I took this move to white here, black takes here, I don't have immediate access to here, black takes one more move over here. But what I didn't realize was white, black, and then white followed by black, I could just simply go in here and black would then be forced to play to the top right region um, and it will close off pretty quick quickly and I'll be able to close out the game pretty well. So I think that's something that kind of missed. So instead of that, I decided to kind of cut across this move, which was still a good move uh, to kind of create an excess along this row and also future access over here. So over here, black did choose to take the edge ultimately. So this was kind of where uh, one of my first major mistakes came in. So I think once black kind of committed to the shape to the top right, it's important that black is, you know, trying to strangling the excess within this. So that's kind of the typical shape of a, you know, a FAT draw or a com off. So I know that this is, you know, a typical book move to kind of play to kind of extend the edge first, but somehow I decided to play this one first just to form that clamp shape. Uh, giving two options at once. But yeah, I think that was a mistake because once black followed up with this move and closed off the excess, I realized I was kind of pressured uh, that and I was losing excess pretty fast. So it was a bit concerning over here. So basically over here, one of the concerns was if I were to play here, this would create a quiet move for him and then I would kind of run out of moves to the right pretty quickly. So yeah, that was probably one of the concerns, one of the main concerns that I have. And if I were to play this move over here, uh, Black would easily be able to kind of cut across, uh, probably here, still have one more move over here, and I wouldn't be able to do a stoner because Black has this diagonal control, this mini diagonal. So there's no way I could really attack this unbalanced edge per se. So after thinking through a little bit more, kind of decided to do a kind of like a cage move just to cage up this disc on F5 so that F5 continues to poison this move and prevents Black from playing there. But over here, I was indeed already under pressure because Black played this. And then subsequently, I was kind of stuck because I didn't really have any options to come out. So thereafter, I decided to jump in to try to create excess over here to the poison move. And of course, Black decided to squeeze in which is the right move, definitely, because Black continues to control this line over here that doesn't give me easy access, and also this mini diagonal line across here. So it was definitely pressurizing for me. So I just jumped in to the crossback. I think over here, Bo Xiang played uh, very well. 
to kind of just continue keeping out the pressure uh, on the line over here. Just a simple cross move. Just wait for me to commit the error. So over here, I did feel that I didn't have much of a choice. This mini diagonal was being controlled. I didn't have much of a choice. Uh, so if I were to play here, it pretty much opens up the quiet move to the top. So in the end, I did choose here. Which, yeah, in the end, you know, I didn't really have much of a choice uh, after all. So over here, obviously, uh, over here, obviously, Bo Xiang just went for the feed because it's a simple unbalanced edge attack. So after White plays this, uh, Bo Xiang didn't even play this to go for here because he probably didn't want me to switch in or, or take away this excess. He wanted to lock in the diagonal first, which is fair. So this was quite interesting. So... Over here, without much options, I had to squeeze just from here, just kind of skimming some this over here. So I didn't have much of an option here. So the follow-up here is pretty straightforward. Bo Xiang went for the squeeze over here to kind of gain tempo. At the same time, I couldn't allow him to gain tempo over here because I was already losing moves. So I had to squeeze in to rush in and push him into the corner, basically. So he did go for the corner piece. Uh, so my bet over here is to kind of like run par natural parity out and somehow get the top left corner in the end. But don't think it played out as well as I wished it would have. So over here, I think Bo Xiang kind of stopped for a while just to think about it, think about the sequence. So I think he correctly decided that, you know, he'll probably play this uh, quiet move, try to conserve as many moves as possible. So basically, after Black has played this quiet move, uh, which Bo Xiang played, uh, so essentially, my only thought is to try to preserve as many moves as possible uh, within to the top left corner. And then so basically, my objective was to just slice out the diagonal, try to poison some moves over here. So white, black, and then try to gain some moves over here to kind of force a parity region so that I can sweep up the disc to the left corner. But unfortunately, <laughs> as my bad feeling, uh, you know, during the finals kind of prevailed, uh, it, it showed definitely. So black played here and basically swept up the disc. I had to play the poison to the X square. So I think uh, one of the good things about this end game was that I did play the best sequence, the best struggle sequence at least. But uh, Bo Xiang unfortunately found a special swindle over here. So he came over to the corner first to avoid being poisoned to the corner. So he swept up to the corner where I had to follow, basically slotting into the X-square, which is the odd region trying to poison this move, essentially, so that I can wedge in between. But over here, a very special move that he played, after he played out the sequence, there was only one uh, positive move. Because if he played to the corner and I played here, he would have to uh, you know, potentially give up this wedge. Uh, to me, but he did realize something uh, very, very special, which was actually kind of like a force swindle to kind of enable the swindle. So this was a plus 10, all the remaining moves were negative. So I would say, you know, credit to him for finding this move. And basically over here, I knew that the game was done for me because uh, there was no way I could prevent this swindle. Either way, I had to play this now and create a swindle for him to play consecutive moves since black has this control of this line. So black, black will be two consecutive moves. And even if I play it over here, forced him to flip and squeezed in, uh, essentially I wouldn't really have enough uh, moves to kind of uh, play to as well. So that was kind of like the, the dilemma. I wouldn't have enough this basically because white, black, white, and then black, white, simply there wouldn't be enough this because of this entire row being black. So that would defeat the purpose. So basically, I did play the best move to the corner. But uh, over here, essentially, black played this move and force feed me because I couldn't play to the X square. I had to play to this C square and that created a swindle. So that swindle actually enabled him to play two consecutive moves here, thereby protecting this entire column, uh, B column of discs. So as a result, I didn't have enough this to win the game, even though I did retain parity. So I wasn't fast enough to kind of wrap it up from the top left around. So that was unfortunate for me. Uh, but I guess given the overall form I was playing across SNOC, the entire tournament, I was lucky to kind of squeeze into the semifinals. And of course, I did have a very good semi. Uh, I, I did get a very good match against Anthony in the semifinals. So I did get a very smooth run uh, over there into the finals. So unfortunately, I couldn't 
win this finals and convert it, but still a very good tournament for me. So um, hopefully all of you out there, uh, when you're playing tournaments, uh, hopefully the nerfs does not get to you or um, you know tiredness basically doesn't get to you. Hopefully you are able to kind of pace yourselves and get the best result possible. Thank you very much for joining me in this review of my Singapore National Hotel Championship 2022. And hopefully I'll see you at the World Hotel Championship 2022 as well. Thank you and goodbye.